Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Accompanied by good morning. Accompanied by the lovely Shelley Buchanan, herself a former colleague of Richard Nixon in the White House, would you please welcome Pat Buchanan? I'm John Taylor, Executive Director of the Nixon Foundation. It is a great pleasure to have you all with us. I wonder how many of you are members of the Associates Club or the President's Council of the Nixon Foundation. If so, raise your hand so that we may thank you for your generous contributions year in and year out to the programming at the Nixon Foundation, which makes so much of what we do, including Pat Buchanan's presence here possible. For those of you who have not joined one of our members organizations. You may do so for as little as $50 a year. It entitles you to unlimited free admission to the Nixon Library, discounts in the museum store, and the satisfaction of knowing that it is you who bring Pat and Shelley back to the place where we are so pleased to welcome them. If I may, a few commercial announcements about our institution, particularly during a time of war. It is vitally important that we remember our veterans, and we will do so once again on Saturday, November 11th, with the Nixon Library's traditional Veterans Day remembrance. Admission will be free of charge all day that day in honor of our young men and women, all of them volunteers in uniform. There will be a special ceremony featuring remarks on the war of te on terrorism by Colonel James Seaton, who is the commanding officer of Camp Pendleton Marine Corps Base at 11 o'clock on Saturday, November 11th, and at 2 o'clock a return engagement by the Huntington Beach Concert Band here in the East Room performing patriotic favorites. Uh, underway right now is construction of a massive train track in the temporary exhibition gallery. If you're like me, one of the things you remember about Christmas time is a Lionel train under the tree. And with the help of some amazing uh, train hobbyists in our region, we are opening on November 18th in our special exhibition gallery, a holiday festival of trains with over 100 toy trains, including the Lily Bell, which was built and enjoyed by the legendary Walt Disney himself in his back backyard in Brentwood. So please be sure to make sure your holiday planning uh, includes a stop at the Nixon Library to see that exhibition. Then on November 30, a colleague of Pat Buchanan from the White House returns to the Nixon Library for the first in a series of conversations with the incoming federal director of the Nixon Library, Dr. Timothy Naftali. He, working with Sandy Quinn, our assistant director, the first collaboration between the federal side and the foundation side, they've worked together on a series of in-conversation programs where Dr. Naftali will interact with newsmakers and history makers. Al Haig will be the first on November 30th and on Saturday, January 13th, an amazing treat at the age of 96. He is at the top of his form. Art Linkletter will be at the Nixon Library in dialogue with Tim Naftali. A great way to go, Sandy. Sandy gets his man. Let's give Sandy Quinn a hand for lining up Art Linkletter at the Nixon Library. And on December 7th, my wife and colleague, uh, the, associate, the Assistant Executive Director of the Nixon Foundation, Kathy O'Connor, President Nixon's last Chief of Staff, has lined up the Duke Ellington Orchestra for Christmas at the White House here in the East Room. Pat Buchanan was probably there when Duke Ellington himself came and performed in the East Room in the White House 
In 1969, President Nixon gave an award to uh, Duke Ellington, and uh, so he performed at the White House. His orchestra is still performing and will be here on December 7th. Tickets are available to that as well, so please inquire at the front desk. And finally, for pres the anniversary of President Nixon's birth on January 9th, we'll once again have a Lockhart free day, and the President's brother, Ed Nixon, will be here to give a speech about his beloved brother. And Mr. Buchanan, thank you for letting us take advantage of this magnificent audience to get all those commercial announcements in. <laughs> He is a native of our nation's capital. He graduated with honors from that hotbed of liberalism, Georgetown University. <laughs> he was trained as a journalist at the Columbia Journalism School in New York City, and he was working for the St. Louis Globe Democrat in 1966 when Richard Nixon, who was beginning to plan during that vitally important and decisive wartime midterm election year of 1966. Richard Nixon was planning his comeback for the presidency and knew a property when he met one, when he encountered the young Pat Buchanan and brought him to work at the White House. Pat has served three presidents, Nixon, Reagan, and Ford, and he has run for president three times. He has written five books. We see him almost every every day on television. He is a regular commentator on the McLaughlin Group, on CNN's Capital Gang, and on Crossfire. In fact, he helped launch Crossfire and was one of the uh, uh, institutional hosts of Crossfire between 1982 and 1999. He tried all that time to reform CNN. <laughs> Finally laid that mighty burden down, but now he still appears from time to time. He said just yesterday he debated James Carvel. Some of you may have seen that, and he also writes two or three columns a week. And he is a courageous uh, critic of the Bush administration on two big issues. He opposed the intervention in Iraq in the spring of 2003, and he has been a vocal opponent as well of President Bush's proposed immigration reform, and that is predominantly the subject of his new book, State of Emergency, which brings him and I believe many of you here today. He has been called America's leading populist conservative. We call him, as we welcome him back to the Nixon Library, Friend, would you welcome Pat Buchanan? Good to have you here, friend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I must. Uh, it is really. Um, it is nostalgic for me to come back here. I was here at the opening of the library and was here for Mrs. Nixon's funeral and the President's funeral. We came out for that. And I have never seen this East Room, and it is really, John Taylor, it is just magnificent. Uh, you know, in the East Room in the White House, I haven't been back there since uh, George Bush I was President. And I remember my last visit there was for the Medal of Freedom that was given to Ronald Reagan in January of 1993. But this is, a, uh, this is a magnificent place that they have in memory of the former president and first lady. And I want to thank the folks who have invited me back here, Sandy Quinn and John Taylor and everyone. Uh, it is truly nostalgic. It was, uh, I met Richard Nixon, as John mentioned, I went to a cocktail party in Belleville, Illinois. And matter of fact, December of 1965, I was an editorial writer for the St. Louis Globe Democrat and Mr. Nixon, that was after the Goldwater campaign, where he had been campaigning for Senator Goldwater as hard as uh, Senator Goldwater campaigned for himself, as a matter of fact. And uh, he filled in for Senator Dirksen, and I went over and introduced myself in a kitchen to him, to Richard Nixon. And I told him I wanted to get aboard early if he was going to run in 1968. And he needed someone to answer his mail in 66. But my entree with him was, I said, Mr. Mr. Vice President, I called him, we've met before. I carried your golf bag at the Burning Tree Country Club, where I was a caddy <laughs> in the 1950s. I went out there when General Eisenhower would come out 
to Burning Tree. And I remember General Eisenhower was president then, and he came down. It was a long lane. It was way outside Washington, D.C., way out River Road then, and you had to hitchhike out there blazing hot. And I remember coming back from caddying, and General Eisen President Eisenhower's limousine came by, so I put out my thumb. <laughs> and I got the famous Eisenhower wave as he went by. <laughs> but uh, when I was in that kitchen with Mr. Nixon in 1965, I did not tell him my assessment of him as a golfer, which probably is the reason I was hired. <laughs> the president was not a great golfer, but uh, he was uh, he had a lot of persistence at it. I thought what I would talk about, and many folks I've been on television and done an awful lot of radio, almost 300 radio shows on my book, but I thought you might be interested in my assessments as well of our current political situation and our situation in foreign policy, as well as discuss the book. And so let me begin by saying the, the condition, I think, of the Bush administration could be summarized as serious, but not yet grave, but approaching critical. Uh, as the President himself said when he went over to speak to the Gridiron Club, you know, things are very bad. He said, I'm only at 32 percent in the polls. But Dick Cheney asked me, what's my secret? Mr. Cheney is at 18 percent at the time. <laughs> And the president said, you know, I looked around this earlier this year, and I found out there was only one trial lawyer in America who really liked me. And Cheney went out and shot him. <laughs> so we're — the president is now at 37 percent approval, which is, uh, which is rough, but it's not as bad as where he was. Our Congress of the United States, however, uh, 16 percent of the American people think it's doing a fine job. So that is about as low as it's been, and something like by 41 to 14 percent of the American people think that Republicans should be replaced by Democrats in the Congress of the United States. Now, why is the President and why is the Congress in trouble today? I think there are a variety of items. First, let's take the economy. If you look at the macro economy, the larger economy, there is no reason why the president should be in trouble. Unemployment's about 4.5 percent, which is virtually full employment. Inflation remains low and under control. The stock market has been hitting over 12,000, an all-time record. The Dow has gained back all its losses since the year 2000. The Nasdaq hasn't, but it's still at its highest level in five years. So with all of this, why should the President — why should the Republican Party be in grave trouble? The first reason, of course, is the war in Iraq. Something like 65 percent of the American people now believe the war was a mistake, and 65 percent think we ought to start getting out. And the President is held accountable and responsible for the war. Then there's the perception that the President has lost that aura of competence that he had at 9-11 and in the immediate aftermath. The reasons are Katrina, obviously, the Harriet Myers debacle, uh, the Dubai ports deal, and all of these things have damaged the President as a strong leader, especially Katrina, where he was perceived to be out of touch and almost uncaring. I think that's false, incidentally. But there's no doubt that the administration did not move as quickly as it should have, and it allowed its adversaries in the press to portray it as uncaring or even worse. Then there is the perception of hubris and arrogance and corruption. And by that, I not only mean the Abramoff matter with all the, the money going around and the buying and selling, if you will, of favors in Washington between lobbyists and Republican congressmen, the Duke Cunningham thing, are you all familiar with him? I knew Duke uh, Cunningham, and I always admired him, of course. He's a top gun, a great pilot in, uh, in the Vietnam War. But as I said yesterday, you know, when you drive a Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow into the House office building and park it there, to me, that's a cry for help more than anything else. <laughs> I mean, what can this man be thinking, you have to ask yourself. 
And then there, of course, is the Foley matter, which is, a, which is disgraceful. Uh, Mr. Foley and Mr. Kolb, now we now know, taking an un, unnatural interest in all these pages, but even worse than that, the perception that the White House may have, or not the White House, but the administration of the Congress may have covered this up and covered for them and not told the truth. So all of these things adding up, I think, are the reasons why the administration is in such trouble. Now, let me talk about Iraq, because as John Taylor had mentioned, I had opposed the war in Iraq. As a matter of fact, we founded a magazine to urge the President of the United States, stay with Afghanistan, do not march up to Baghdad. I thought it would be a mistake, and I thought what would happen is what very much has happened, and that's what we wrote. But why did President Bush do this? Now, when President Bush ran in the year 2000, and you might recall I was on the ballot at that time, way down the line, uh, when the President ran in 2000, he ran very much as, I would say, more of a Buchanan conservative than a neoconservative in the sense that he said, we, we can't be arrogant in our foreign policy. We can't go into the business of nation building. We have to pick and choose the places we intervene. We need a more humble foreign policy, he said. And I thought all of that was right down, right down my alley. I think what happened is after 9-11, as we know, just as President Bush had a religious conversion in the 1980s, where he'd lived a, apparently a pretty wild life before then, he was radicalized by 9-11. You know, Herman Kahn, when I, once, matter of fact, was in the Nixon White House, he came into the, into the Roosevelt Room, and we would used to have seminars with him for a couple of hours. He was a brilliant mind, one of the most brilliant of the generation. And he would say there's only two periods of time when you can capture you know, a people and change their minds and course in life dramatically. One is from the years from about two or three to six or seven years old, and the second is when they go to college, and a lot of people change. But George Bush had one of these midlife conversions, I think, and he was, he was sold on this, on this idea, the, uh, the idea that, 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 and I'll describe it in a minute, of a neoconservative foreign policy, which really has its roots in sort of Woodrow Wilson utopianism. I'll talk about that in a minute, but as for Iraq, I argued, why should we attack a nation which does not threaten us, has not attacked us, does not want war with us, to strip it of weapons we don't even know it has? And it turned out they did not have those weapons. The president was persuaded, I think, by many of his advisors that, that this would be a cakewalk war that he would be the Winston Churchill of his generation. Uh, and what has happened? Well, it hasn't been a cakewalk. We have 2,800 dead Americans, 20,000 wounded, some of them very, very, very severe, uh, severely. They would not have survived in previous wars. 300 billion cost, and there is no end to this war currently in sight. We have created a haven in Anbar province for terrorists who are coming from all over the Middle East it did not exist before under Saddam, no matter how wicked Saddam was, and we see no end in sight to the conflict. In defense of the President and Mr. Cheney and Mr. Rumsfeld, let me say this. They believed in this war, and I think they still believe in it. The President believes it's the right cause and right for America. I think on the other side, the Democratic Party acted cynically. Now, under the Constitution, Madison Madison and Hamilton said that we want to separate the power to wage war and fight wars from the power to declare war and take us to war. And the reason for that, of course, is that they were familiar with the experience of kings walking their nations into war and fighting the war for dynastic reasons and putting all the citizens at risk or the armies at risk for the reasons of the king. Therefore, the parliament should declare the war and the king should fight it. And in this case, the Congress of the United States, in my judgment, particularly the Democratic Party, which I don't think believed in the war, did not do due diligence. Daschle, Biden, Hillary Clinton, Kerry, Edwards, Reed. All of them voted to give the president a blank check for war. Daschle was asked why he did it in October of 2002. He said to get it behind us. 
In other words, let's get this issue off the table where the Republicans are strong so we can focus on the areas where the Republicans are weak. I think Congress did not serve America well on that occasion. And as I say, at least whatever you say with regard to the president, he believed in this war. Now, let me talk about U.S. foreign policy because here is where my disagreements with the president as he has as he has come to enunciate foreign policy post 9-11 are profound. You know, people call me uh, an isolationist. Actually, that's one of the nicest things that people call me. <laughs> but they refer to me that, and, and it is not true because America has never, never, ever been an isolationist nation. But we did have a philosophy of foreign policy before the Cold War and I supported president, all the presidents in my lifetime during the Cold War, including the three I worked for, President Nixon, Ford, and Reagan. But before the Cold War, our foreign, except in the Wilson era and World War II, American foreign policy was basically a foreign policy of, of unilateralism in this sense. We did not enter foreign alliances, and we followed the dictum of Washington, Jefferson, and Quincy Adams that we did not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. We defended American national interests whenever threatened. We would go to war for American national interest, but the idea of going to war for utopian crusades was alien to Americans, and for 20 presidents almost up to Wilson. We didn't do that, and that is why, in my judgment, the American Republic grew so great and mighty and free and independent and powerful while Europeans in the Napoleonic Wars, for example, were slaughtering one another in the hundreds of thousands. So we succeeded. Even in World War I, there was a tremendous force in America, of course, pushed by Irish and German folks as well, to keep us out of that war, and we did stay out of that war. So that at the end of the war, when we got in in 1917 and 1918, when we got in there in considerable numbers in, the, in basically the summer and fall, we only fought for about six or seven months in any strength. We lost 116,000 dead, but the British lost 700,000 dead, where the country wasn't even half the size of ours. The French lost 1.3 million, the Germans 1.2 million, and you can double that in terms of casualties and dead and wounded. And we did not go in to Normandy, for example, until four years after France had fallen. And one of the reasons we stayed out is there was this tremendous force in America, frankly, John F. Kennedy as a young man supported the America First movement, that there was this tremendous force which said, are American interests threatened here or is this another imperial wars, dynastic wars? Is, are these wars and quarrels of these people? Well, the president dropped all that and threw that out. And he's got now what's called the Bush Doctrine. One part of it says we're going to, we'll, in effect, the world's worst regimes will not be allowed to get the world's worst weapons. He threw down that gauntlet, and now North Korea has an exploded an atomic bomb. So that's been challenged, and that's been defied, that policy, and it's being defied by Iran. He says we're going to eliminate tyranny from the face of the earth in his second inaugural. You know, I said, what are we going to do next? We're going to eliminate sin also? I mean, it is utopian to say that. There have been tyrants. We've got 190 nations on Earth. There are tyrants all over the world. Probably half the UN member states, some of their got, those regimes got to power by killing the per person who was in there before them. We're not going to eliminate tyranny in this world. And the third part of it is we're going to democratize the whole world. And we can't be safe until we do. But America's always been the most secure of nations. Wouldn't it, we followed the advice of Washington. How do we remain secure? He said, if you want peace, be prepared for war. You go read the history of, Amer of America, you'll find very, very few countries I could find. I did a book on that called A Republic, Not an Empire. Very, very few countries ever wanted war with the United States of America. Very, very few. The one I could find that did want war was Mexico. And it didn't work out very well for them. But this is, and so the president has, in my judgment, adopted this utopian foreign policy. And I think it's, it is, clearly it is not working. So we are going to have an opportunity, you and I and all of us, 
in this next election to decide what kind of foreign policy America should have. Should we go abroad and fight wars to democratize countries like Iraq? Can we afford to do that? Or should we have a more traditional foreign policy where we defend our vital interests and we do not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy? Now, let me talk about an area where I think the president, this president, President Bush, has been tremendous. And he has been a success. And that is the area of judges and justices. And let me begin with a story. You know, back in 1981, I believe it was, President Reagan selected Sandra Day O'Connor as the first lady justice of the United States. Keeping with my tradition, I oppose that, of course. <laughs> I think I turned out to be right there. <laughs> but in any event, after she was chosen, of course, uh, she discovered that after each session of the Supreme Court, they have a ceremonial lunch for all the justices at the Monocle restaurant before they all go off to their various districts. And all nine justices are there at the table. So naturally, after the first session, the maitre d' came up to Sandra Day O'Connor first and asked her and said, Madam Justice, what will you have? And she said, well, I'll have the steak a la carte. And the maitre d' said, very good, madam, and the vegetables? And she said, oh, they'll have the same thing. Now, <laughs> a lot of those folks were over 80, approaching 90 and rolling, and what it meant was they were going to get new choices for the Supreme Court. So this has befallen this president the same situation. We have John Paul Stevens now, President Ford's appointee. He could retire from the court any time. You hear that Ruth Bader Ginsburg may retire. Now, let me say this about President Bush. His choices for federal judges and Supreme Court justices, we can forget Ms. Meyer, she's gone now, <laughs> have been the finest of any president almost, any president I think in my lifetime. And the president deserves enormous, enormous credit for that and for his courage for fighting for them. This is one of the reasons, frankly, it would be a real disaster to lose, for Republicans to lose the Senate because it might force the president to go to someone other than someone like Roberts and Alito, who I think are outstanding choices. Now, in the, in the battle for the Supreme Court, what is it about? We know the court has imposed forced busing on a number of school districts and torn them apart, made abortion a constitutional right, just declared it de novo, you know, uh, threw out all the laws against, uh, uh, the, uh, against homosexuality in all the states, dumped those out and did generally through God and the Ten Commandments and all the rest out of the public schools. Now, whatever you and I may think about what the court, the wisdom of the court's decision, the question here is, is important for us as Americans. And the question is not what is decided, it is who decides. Now, these decisions I mentioned on throwing religion out of the schools and God and court-ordered busing and things like that, no elected legislature could ever have done that. It would be immediately thrown out of office. And so that what this is about, and what I hope the president understands, because he's on the right track, is that we are deciding how we are to be governed. Our founding fathers threw out a rule of kings. And now we have established a rule of judges. Why should it be on these matters on which I'm sure people in this room profoundly disagree, that we should wait for a first Monday in October for them to tell us what we may do, and what we may not do. Now, this, to me, is the crucial question with regard to the court. It is who decides. I mean, there are folks in here who probably say, I certainly wouldn't want to live in a country where Scalia hands down the rules for all of us. Some of us wouldn't want to live in a country where Ruth Bader Ginsburg decides every decision. And the question is, neither should decide. These issues should be decided by Americans. We used to say in the 19th century, here, sir, the people rule. But the people don't rule on these issues. The judges are ruling. The judges are handing down decisions, and they are not elected. They are appointed, anointed for life. So here is where I think the president deserves great credit. Now, let me go to the issue of my book, Immigration. And let me begin with a story. I, I first took up the issue, frankly, when I came down to 
Southern California in 1991. I had been in favor of President Reagan's amnesty in the White House. I had supported him there. I, I supported the Immigration Act of 1965 when I was an editorial writer. I favorably reviewed John F. Kennedy's book, A Nation of Immigrants, in 1964. I reread it in preparation for this book. I still agree with Kennedy's book. It's a wonderful little book. It's a very positive little book, and the reforms he mentions there were reasonable then, and that's why I supported them. But we were deceived, and we were lied to, about that Immigration Act of 65, given what has happened since. But how I got involved in it, I came down out here, and the people told me that this is the issue, and I'd already been beaten by President Bush in 33 straight primaries. I was gone for 34. And so I went down to the border, and I got a podium there, and behind me were, must have been all these Mexicans were lining up right on the border to run together into the United States because the Border Patrol would be overwhelmed. Border Patrol would catch 10 or 20. The rest of them would run in. They run into the United States. So I got up and I said, we need a security fence along this border 14 miles inland. And behind me, a Mexican fellow said in a loud voice, who is that hombre? <laughs> He's talking about me. And this lady for the Los Angeles Times says, well, that's Pat Buchanan. He's running against President Bush. And this guy says, well, you tell him I'll vote for him if he'll give me a ride to Los Angeles. <laughs> so that's how I first got involved in the issue. And, you know, they said, well, and I was attacked. They compared me to David Duke because I said we need 70 miles of security fence along the border. Now Hillary Rodham Clinton just voted for 700 miles of security fence. So we're making progress. We're making progress. You know, in 1996, Shelley, my wife, who incidentally was with Richard Milhouse Nixon back in uh, 1959, was with him in the campaign of 1960, that great campaign against of John F. Kennedy. She and I, after the New Hampshire primary, my chairman in Arizona made what I think was a tactical mistake. She put me into a, on a buckboard for a Pioneer Day the Thursday after the New Hampshire primary, Thursday or Friday, Thursday, I think, after the New Hampshire primary, and we went through all through Tucson. Unfortunately, it went right through Mexico town. Now, by now, the folks in Mexico town knew who I was. And the Secret Service had never seen anything like it, these huge crowds around. And as I said later, I've never seen so much Mexican food in my life, and most of it was in the air coming toward me. <laughs> so fortunately, we got through that. But let me tell you what this is about, because I do believe, as I write in the book, we are talking about an existential crisis of our country. Iraq is important. This issue of open borders is about the existence of the United States through this century as a single unique nation and a separate people and, and nation that we've had. The numbers, let's just talk about the illegal aliens. The consensus figure, and I think it's probably low, but I've used it, 12 million illegal aliens in this country right now. Bear Stern says it's 20 million. Others say it's 30 million. No one knows how many are here. But if it is only 12 million, that is equal in number to all the Irish people, all the English people, and all the Jewish folks who ever came to this island in its first 350 years. And my source for that is John F. Kennedy himself in his book, A Nation of Immigrants. According to President Bush in Tucson, where he said four and a half million had tried to break in, and this was about a year ago, he now says it's six million. One in every 12 breaking in has a criminal record. Now, if there are 12 million here, and one in every 12 has a criminal record, that means one million illegal aliens with a criminal record, the equivalent of 50 army divisions of 20,000 troops, are in the United States preying upon the American people. Now this 
is, in my judgment, a national crisis that has not been adequately addressed by the leadership of either political party. Every month of this year, first five months were the ones that, by the time I finished writing my book, 150,000 people were stopped breaking in each month of the first five months of this year. In other words, more people breaking into our country than all of the troops we have in Iraq each month breaking into this country. 150,000 when we stopped each month is equal to all the immigrants we had in the period of the entire decade of the 1820s, which was a high decade for immigration in the 19th, early 19th century. Let's take a look at the year 2050. According to the Census Bureau of the United States, there will be 102 million Hispanic folks in America. 102 million. There were probably 2 to 3 million in 1960. They will be heavily concentrated in the American Southwest. California is now 34 percent Hispanic. Texas is 34 percent Hispanic. Arizona is 25 percent Hispanic. New Mexico is 43 percent. Native-born Californians in real numbers, not simply percentages, but in absolute numbers, are leaving California for the first time since the Spanish arrived here. They're going back over the mountains to Colorado, Idaho, Arizona, Nevada. The numbers they are leaving. Why does this present a particular problem? It is because an enormous number of these folks, overwhelming majority of these folks, are from Mexico. And the illegal aliens, overwhelming majority from Mexico. And they're going to be heavily concentrated, this 100 million, in an American Southwest that 58 percent of the Mexican people now believe belongs by right to Mexico. A few years back, I used a term in one of my books, La Reconquista. You find Mexican journalists, intellectuals, politicians, and consuls chuckling and using that same term about what is going on. Now, do I fear a military conquest or a political takeover? No. What I do think is what we are in danger of is the loss linguistically, culturally, socially, and ethnically of the American Southwest. In a sense that by 2050, or take it out to the end of the century, it becomes more a part of Mexico than it is of the United States of America. Now, we can assimilate any individual. There are people here, my ancestors are from Scotland, Ireland, and Germany. We can assimilate individuals from any country, continent, culture on Earth. We cannot assimilate a whole country. You can't move Mexico into the United States or a huge slice of Mexico into the United States and have this remain the one country, one nation, one people we were and are. That is the beginning and the end of a nation. And in the book, I go into this issue, there's an ideological struggle between those of us who might be called traditionals and paleos and the neoconservatives. Neoconservatives say the only thing that unites us is our ideas. In other words, we all believe in democracy, we all believe in equality, we all believe in free markets. That's what unites us. And some of us, others of us say, no, we are a separate and unique people. Whether we are Hispanic Americans or Jewish Americans or, or Scotch-Irish or German, we are a new nationality. We are a distinct and separate people. Now, I grew up in Washington, D.C., where it was a city of 800,000. 400,000 were, were black folks, 400,000 white folks. So we were of two races. But we were of one culture, and we were of one nationality. We all rooted for the same ball teams. We read the same history. We had the same holidays. I can name the ones that you could name when we were in school, exactly what days we got off. We read the, had the same literature. We had the same language. By and large, we were of the same Christian faith, Protestant or Catholic, some Jewish folks. 
but we were all Americans. Now this is, to me, nationality is the key. And when you have folks, 500,000, marching under Mexican flags in your own cities, those folks are not Americans. They've come here to work, they're not bad people, but they're not Americans. And our whole idea of immigration used to be we wanted people who came here who, when they got here, they wanted to become Americans, and they certainly wanted their kids to become Americans. They were wanted to look to the future. And they say they're proud of where they came from, they're proud of their roots, but they're looking to the future, and their future was as Americans. And this is what I think is being lost. And I find some people, I go to audiences, especially student audiences, who cares? Well, if they don't care, I think we will lose this country we were raised in. You know? If you wish to see, and I'm afraid if we wish to see, I just read yesterday coming out in the New York Times, uh, the ethnicity in Russia. If you take a look around the world, countries are coming apart over the issues of what? Race, ethnicity, language, culture, religion. Look at the Soviet Union, it broke apart. The Baltic countries, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, they're not Russian, they're ethnically different. They're different from each other by religion. Lithuanians are heavily Catholic. The others are more Protestant, Lutheran. You see Czechoslovakia, Democratic, had been together for years in the Holy Roman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Democratic, they had to split. Yugoslavia, I mean, it's the name of balkanization. Horrible, bloody wars between people who had lived together side by side on a small peninsula since time immemorial. But the Serbs were, Serbs are Orthodox, Croatians are Catholic, one was under the Turks, the other was under the Austro-Hungarian Empire, all these things. You see it down there in these elections, and people should take a closer look at those elections down there in, uh, in Latin America, Morales, Evo Morales. They're talking about indigenous peoples, and 500 years we've been persecuted, people stole our land, they gotta get out of our land. You see these in, in Mecha, some of these organizations out here, these militant Mexican organizations. They use the same terms. It's a bronze, this is the bronze continent. We're a bronze culture. Bronze people deserve it. And you saw it in those demonstrations where, where brown is good and things like that in those Los Angeles demonstrations. Now this is a rising movement all over the world. And it quite frankly is anti-Western. And it is anti-white in many cases. And there's just no question about it. And when things like this are going on, we ought to take a look at it and see if what we're doing in terms of this open borders, all the ollie in free policy is not risking something vital and critical. And as Sophocles said, you know, there's no greater loss on this earth than the loss of one's own country. Theodore Roosevelt, I think, said it pretty well, the one absolutely certain way of bringing this nation to ruin, of preventing all possibility of its continuing to be a nation at all, would be to permit it to become a tangle of squabbling nationalities. And I fear that is what we are risking, and that's why I wrote this book. Let me talk now a little bit about the politics of 2006. That may be even grimmer than what I've just said <laughs> for the Republicans. The Republicans are clearly in some danger of losing both houses, there's no doubt about it. Uh, I think the House of Representatives, if I had to bet, I, I would be astonished if Republicans didn't lose it. As I was talking to Carville yesterday, and he had a good point, I was in a sort of a debate conversation with him. He said, if the Democrats can't win Congress in this year, they ought to go into another line of work. <laughs> and I think, uh, I think that's about right. So I think the House is in real danger, but here's what you want to watch on election night in the Senate. For the Democrats to get the Senate, and it's not that easy, unless there's a, a tidal wave that goes over all the races, in which case they can wipe out an awful lot of people. If, as of now, for the Democrats to win the Senate, they got to win, they got to pick up, they got to take Ohio, Pennsylvania, Montana, and Rhode Island, which are all four held by Republicans. They have to hold on to New Jersey, where they got a candidate who's got a corruption problem, Menendez, they have to hold that. Then they have to take two out of three of the upper border states, the firewall that the Republicans are building. 
Tennessee, Virginia, and Missouri. They'd have to take two out of three. If they do all that, then they can win the Senate. So I don't think the Senate is lost yet to Republicans. The House, it looks to me very hard to see how they can survive some of these races. They've got an awful lot of personal problems and some of their members in them. So that's 2006. 2008? So <laughs> Someone said, oh, Lord. It's, uh, that's concern about Hillary, would it be? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's no doubt about it that let me give the good news and bad news. Hillary is clearly the front runner, but I am less sure Hillary's going to be the nominee. I'll tell you why. She's done an excellent job in terms of de-demonizing herself, if you will, <laughs> to the degree that she can do that after the 1990s. But she has done a good job in the Senate, everybody agrees. But she was at about 50 percent, and all the, everybody else was in uh, single digits for the nomination. She's now fallen down to about 33 percent, and Al Gore, a very exciting candidate. He's at 16 percent. He's at 16 percent, and Edwards is about 15 percent, and I think Edwards is ahead, maybe, or he may be up close in the Iowa caucuses. And, and Mrs. Clinton, she's got some problems. One of them is, uh, is Bill. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not just talking about, about the dog's tendency not to stay on the porch. I'm talking that. Uh, uh, Look, I'm talking about the fact that if, if she goes out and runs, he overshadows her. And, uh, and, and there's no doubt, no, very few politicians have the gifts Clinton have, frankly, the gifts to be able to speak well and, and to stand up at a podium and, and really move a crowd and stuff. And she doesn't have that. She's much more programmed. She's very smart, but she's programmed. And uh, she's never been in a real battle the way Bill Clinton was all his life in campaigns and things. And so I don't know how she can handle herself. And there is, you know, they talk, there is a right-wing conspiracy out there. And that right-wing conspiracy is waiting for Hillary to show up. I know it exists because I'm part of it. <laughs> so I think, <laughs> so I think that I would say the, the candidates to watch uh, in the race against her, I would say are Al Gore, if he gets in, certainly, and Edwards. And Edwards has done very well. He's gone out there. He's been very quiet. He's been out there for two years working very hard. His wife has a new book out. It's a uh, New York Times bestseller. And so I would watch them. And this is why you've seen this big push for Barack Obama in the last week or so. Many Democrats are fearful that Hillary and Gore, if they're the two prospective nominees that neither of them can win. The Democrats, I think Condi Rice is out of the picture. I think she was very high up early on. Uh, Giuliani is running first in the polls, but I mean, Giuliani, with due respect, he's pro-gay rights, he's in favor of affirmative action, he's pro-abortion, and he's against guns. And you can't get through New Hampshire and have all those positions. <laughs> So I don't think that Giuliani really, I mean, if I, he had asked me to advise him, I would say, you know, you're at about 30 percent and you're going to go down from day one when you go into these uh, primaries and caucuses. I don't see how he strengthens himself, in other words, and I can see how he can be weakened badly. I think the front runner and a prohibitive favorite right now is John McCain, quite frankly. Uh, uh, now. We all have similar sentiments on some things. <laughs> but I think the problem is, the problem is here is this. It is that uh, first, what, the, what I just heard in this crowd is the way conservatives and traditionalists, many of them feel about Senator McCain, that he is not one of us, he's not a conservative, he's a, he's a Republican who doesn't represent Arizona so much as he represents the big media. But, but no doubt about it that McCain is much further out in front than people realize. He's done an awful lot more to lock, lock up support. He's been gotten well with the Bush family. He's gone down to Liberty University and spoken at Jerry Falwell's university and all the rest of it. And he's not only further out front, I think, than people realize there is no conservative challenger there who's a strong challenger. There was Senator Allen, but he had an unfortunate, um, he used an unfortunate word, macaca, in Virginia, 
which is, uh, and he's had a very, very rough campaign, and he'll be lucky to survive in Virginia if he does. But I don't think he'll be running for president, so the conservatives have no one in the field right now. And, and Newt is presenting himself maybe as the conservative champion, but I don't know if he's going to get into it himself. Uh, you know, I don't know whether, you know, he's got something in common, as someone said, uh, that if you take McCain and, McCain and Newt and, uh, and Giuliani, the three of them have eight wives between them. And that's a little tough <laughs> in a family values party. So, uh, so we've got that difficulty. So how is it going to come out? I don't know. You know, and people have even said, Pat, your issues on trade and on immigration and on the war seem to be right. Why don't you get into this myself? And I have said, no, I don't think so. And I'll tell you why in closing. There are many, many reasons. Uh, one is, of course, I left the Republican Party in 2000. But another is what happened in that race. Now, as you all know or may remember or may not, our, we started off fairly high in the polls for a third-party candidate, 15 percent. We started disintegrating, and we had a bad convention in Long Beach that ended in a, pretty much in a gigantic fist fight. So uh, things went badly, and after we went out on the road, I started because I found out, I talked to Nader, I said, Ralph, and Ralph was running third party also, I said, Ralph, you know, I think we're in there, Bush and Gore are in the Super Bowl, and I think we're in the Gator Bowl out or something out here in Hawaii or something. So uh, nobody's paying any attention to us. So that didn't bother me much. I was on the road and I said, look, I tried to run third party, create this third party, and I wasn't going to be able to do it. We had all these problems. The Republicans knocked me off, tried to knock me off tickets. I was on 30 ballots. They got me knocked off in Michigan, knocked off here. So I was going along and I said, well, it didn't work. And so I said to myself, but my old friend Claire Booth Luce, who was a great lady, once told me that, Pat, there, don't worry about do your best, don't worry, that even the greatest Americans get only one line in the history books. I thought of that, I said, that's right, but look, George Washington, father of his country, not bad. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves and restored the Union. Ronald Reagan won the Cold War. And I thought, what's my one line going to be? And I was thinking, I thought, and I remembered Mo Udall, and I had been down in Tombstone, Arizona, and out in Boot Hill, and there's that, uh, that, that headstone out there that says, here lies Jake Smith. He done his damnedest. And I thought, that's a pretty good, you know, uh, epitaph, and I thought that would be just fine. You know, but, but, then, but then I woke up one night in a cold sweat, and it was, I had seen in my dream a headstone, and it said, here lies Pat Buchanan. He elected Al Gore. <laughs> so I said, Lord, whatever happens, don't let that happen. I mean, I'll have to get in my navigator and drive, just drive. The conservatives will be after me the rest of my life. And so sure enough, I heard this voice in the dream, and the voice says, not to worry, Patrick, since you've lived a relatively good life, I'm going to arrange it so that you don't elect Al Gore. You're going to elect George W. Bush. And I said, well, how can that be? Do you understand who I'm drawing votes from right now? And the voice said, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to have to fool around a little bit with the ballots in Palm Beach County. <laughs> We're going to have to fix it so that when all those nice ladies come out from the condos who love you so much, Pat, and they go to vote for Al Gore, they're going to wind up voting for you. And Al Gore will lose Florida, and then he will lose the nation, and you will be a hero. But Patrick, don't ever try something like this again. Thank you very much.
My friends, Pat would be pleased to take some of your questions. This is a knowledgeable and erudite Nixon Library crowd. Please try to keep your questions short and brisk, and I'll bring the microphone to you. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Buchanan, uh, what do you think of CNN's taking pictures of the enemy, uh, 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 position, positioning themselves against our, uh, our men? Uh, the gentleman's asking a question about the CNN uh, piece that um, I gather it took footage from, from Al Jazeera or someone provided by an enemy who had uh, showed uh, not a simulation, but the actual sniping and killing of an American soldier. And the footage was, uh, was taken, and someone did a narration over it. And I heard it on the radio, and I was sickened by it. I thought it was just sickening that they would show the, the shooting and killing of an American soldier as though this was an interesting uh, piece of news. And uh, I don't understand the values at the network I work for, CNN. I worked for them for 20 years. I don't understand their values in doing something like that, and I thought it was disgusting and appalling. And it ought to be universally condemned. Over here on the far left, Pat, far yeah. left. Hi, Pat. Thanks for all you do. I'm wondering uh, what your opinion is, uh, what's going on in Congress now. I, well, along <laughs> with most American support, building a fence along the right. U.S.-Mexican border. But now I'm told, or I think I heard Pat o uh, Bill O'Reilly say that it's all a shell game, that they're, they're passed it, but they're not going to fund it. Is that true? Uh, the question is about the security fence, which was voted, and some funding was voted for it. However, apparently there's discretion on the part of the uh, Homeland Security and the administration as to whether or not they want to build the fence or whether they want to build a virtual fence or they want to use it for something else. I think they're playing games in Washington. I think we've won the argument. We've won the battle. We have the whole country with us. As I mentioned, in Pennsylvania, 79 percent of Pennsylvanians oppose amnesty. 82 percent want a border wall. And if, frankly, the Republicans who control both houses of Congress, even after we've won the battle and we've won the votes, if they fail to carry that out, then I think they really, they're really inviting punishment by defeat in 2008 if they don't do that. I mean, that is my view. I mean, we fought this battle for 15 years, and we've won it. And we've got the country with us now. And I think that security fence has got to be built. I'll tell you, if an amnesty is granted and no security fence is built, I really believe we are risking the end of the United States of America because the whole world knows our back door is open. And if you don't secure it, the whole world is coming. The numbers from other than Mexico who have arrived at the border in the last three years have tripled. The whole world knows now how to get into the United States. So I think, the, uh, I think when the Congress comes back, whoever controls it, there really ought to be a demand, constant demand, made upon the Congress and upon the President and Vice President to do their duty and enforce the law, quite frankly, as they have not been doing it, either party, for the last 15 years. My name is uh, Mitsuo Nakai. I'm, I'm a citizen of the United States. Uh, speak. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Speaking of the uh, foreign policy, how do you deal with the North uh, North Korean crisis. The North Korean crisis? Um, I think that uh, in terms of dealing with it now, I do not think Bush should have made that axis of evil speech uh, where he said, we're not going to let the world's worst nations, we're not going to be allowed to get the world's worst weapons. Then he attacked Iraq and he put Iran and North Korea on notice. You better get nuclear weapons or the same thing's going to happen to you. And so they went and got nuclear weapons, the North Koreans did, and they, in effect, called the President's bluff, and it turned out to be a bluff. Now, what the President is doing now is the right course, I think, especially with regard to China. I don't know if it's true, but the Chinese do have leverage. Chinese control the oil, they control food, and the Chinese have enough leverage to bring down the government of, of, uh, of, uh, of Kim Jong-il. They have that. And I think I would work with the Chinese, and I'd also tell the Chinese this. Look, um, if North Korea develops a nuclear arsenal, it's a problem for us, but it's going to be a problem for you, too, 
because the Japanese and the South Koreans and maybe the Taiwanese will follow suit. And I would play that card with the Chinese and tell them, but I'll tell you what I'd do now is uh, I don't think you can keep American soldiers right on the DMZ. They're nuclear hostages now. They're doing less to defend that country than they are hostages to Kim Jong-il. If we do something to him, he can explode nuclear weapons over them. So I would have moved them out before, and I think we ought to move them. I know we're moving them back down the peninsula. I would almost move them out of, uh, out of South Korea, because the South Koreans have not been terribly helpful on this. You know? Mr. Buchanan? Yes? OK, Hi. yes, ma'am. Uh, there was one name on that list of Republican presidential hopefuls missing, Mitt Romney. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yes, he, yes, he was. My mistake. Um, Mitt Romney is likely, in my judgment, to emerge as the challenger, because everything — I don't know Mitt personally. I knew his father. I mean, President Nixon, we ran against his father up in New Hampshire, and we were probably cruel to him. But uh, I know the — I don't know the son, but the uh, — everything I hear about him is he is a uh, — he's charismatic. He's extremely intelligent. He's a very attractive candidate. I don't know how conservative he is. If you run for, run for governor of Massachusetts and win, you probably haven't run on a conservative platform. <laughs> so I think he might have that problem. But I think he is the fresh face and the most interesting face out there. He will have what people have mentioned, and you have to consider it, the fact of, that he is a Mormon could give him real trouble with the evangelical Christians in South Carolina and all across the South. So, uh, but there's no doubt that he is a really a fresh face, and, uh, and he'll get tremendous attention. And everybody I've talked to that's — I know a lot of folks in New Hampshire, naturally, who call me and tell me he really uh, — he sort of lit up the room, and they were very impressed with him, even though they may have gone in not agreeing with him. So I apologize for not mentioning uh, Mitt Romney. Are you part of the Californians for Romney there? <laughs> Back here on the left, Pat. Okay, right. Now, Pat. Uh, we're in Iraq now. What about the cut and run, the guys that want to cut and run? Uh, we have now heard on the news this morning more Republicans are in that mode. Uh, there's no way. In my, in my view, you can't. Okay. You want, to down choice, by you the want way. to identify yourself for the crowd here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm Dick Mountjoy. Dick Mountjoy, who was the chairman of my campaign in California and who is now the candidate right. for the United States Senate. Uh, there's actually two questions that I had, one uh, on, on Iraq, the cut and run crowd, and then the other, uh, the news, uh, the, the polls, which, you know, right. you can believe them or not, but they're saying that, um, that the pr majority of people believe that the Democrats can solve the illegal alien problem better than Republicans, and we've been in that fight. How do you, how do you, what do you, how do you attribute that? Uh, you know, uh, Dick, uh, well, I mean, Dick Mountjoy has been a leader in this battle as long as I have and even before I have in California. And, uh, and I'll tell you, Dick, I think the reason people believe that is one thing is the Republican Party is so low, and so they're given the — even the Democrats, people are saying, well, they're better on terrorism. I think that's a reflection of how low the Congress is and how low the President is. But it's secondly a reflection of the fact that, in truth, the President of the United States agrees more with Teddy Kennedy on this border issue, I think, than he does with you and me. And that is tragic. And uh, I don't think his — I don't think President Bush's heart is in the fence. I don't think he believes in it. And — but but when you win the battle, you got to enforce the laws of the United States, you know? <laughs> yes, sir. I mean uh, — oh, oh, I'm sorry. Right, okay. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Uh, I realize or read lately in the last week or so that George Allen is beating his opponent. Right. And can he really be defeated over making such a silly comment? That just — I know the media is not for him, mm -hmm. but that silly word, I just can't imagine that that could defeat a man who really seems very good to me. Well, George Allen has an outstanding record as a senator, no doubt about it. And I live in Virginia. And uh, I will say this, in Jim Webb, who was the Secretary of the Navy, who was a war hero in, in, uh, in Vietnam. I've known Jim Webb since he came back from Vietnam. I used to have him on my radio show 25, 30 years ago. Um, he's, a strong can he's, a, he's a strong force. He, Webb's not a great candidate. 
On the Makaka incident, now you're exactly right, it was not simply the fact that, that Allen made a gaffe, and it took him several days to correct it, and it was the fact that the Washington Post had put it on the front page day after day after day. They ran editorials on it. All the newspapers piled on it. If it had been a Democrat, they would have hit him once and let it go. There's no question about that. And then on the uh, where he had heard it, was he Jewish and all this other stuff, they came, they took that out and they played that. For two months that went on. I do agree, in the last 10 days, that George Allen seems to have gotten his footing back. And it looked like he just lost his footing, was all over the lot. And I do believe he is ahead marginally ahead of Jim Webb. Now, one of the problems is, and I live in Northern Virginia, is Virginia is changing. Northern Virginia, where I live, is, uh, is nothing like the rest of Virginia. And in the rest of Virginia, Allen is winning in a landslide. But in Northern Virginia, which is huge now, and it's got a couple of million people there, uh, Webb is winning by a significant margin. If I had to bet on Virginia right now, I would bet on George Allen. <laughs> and back on the left. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Buchanan, um, I know after the World War II, the U.S. border control was still weak, right? Uh, during the Eisenhower and John right. Kennedy. And John Kennedy loved every immigrant, refugees, and even loved the Chinese people like me and love every Cuban refugee, then he still, he still got defeated by, by an illegal immigrant. Then today, since the George W. Bush up, then he tried to build out the gate and close the gate slowly, 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 and build a, protect some settled illegal immigrant, immigrant and well, I, um, I apologize. But, I'm not. I is there, know, is there a question here? I, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I can't. I oh, can't make oh, out exactly what you're saying. Oh, three minutes, five minutes. Oh, then I don't know what will be happen if Yuri Giuliani served eight year after President Bush, and who will be the next Republican candidate, George Allen, after Yuri Giuliani? I hope so. You say who is the? Um... Yeah, all the question I, I talk about, like the closing the gate for the illegal immigrants and save the America, American value, principal value, and also yeah. capitalism. Pardon? You know? Who's the candidate that will build a fence? OK. Um, I think you may have stumped me. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I do know this. There is no better time to get commitments, solid commitments, out of people than when they want to be President of the United States. And by March of this coming year, they're all going to have to be, anybody that's a serious candidate for President, unless they've got 50 million in the bank, like Miss Hillary Rodham Clinton will have, they will have to have announced by March. Because if you don't get out there in Iowa by March, or you don't get into New Hampshire, all the, the, the energetic people who organize and who are dedicated and committed, they will have committed themselves to someone else. That's why Romney is up there in New Hampshire. He talks to all the people. He's talked to my folks who are with me. Same is true of the folks at, in Iowa. By now, they've all been talked to by prospective candidates, and so they're going to have to announce by March. And when they do, I think every one of them should be put on the spot Will you build this fence that the President is not building and that Congress has authorized and Congress has said we want built? So I think that's a way to do it. It's a golden opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, I'd like you to comment on the North American Union and the disconnect that I see if we build a wall to what, tear it down so that the North American Union well, and CAFTA can survive? Well, this is the North American Union is a uh, is a vision of elites, and it's particularly promoted by Vicente Fox of uh, Mexico. He went to Madrid and said, we want the situation in North America like you have in Europe, where we wipe out the borders between Mexico, Canada, and the United States, and not only goods are free to cross, but people can cross at will. I believe President Bush has, in his heart, signed on to that idea. There's no doubt about it. Now, if you've got a security fence, that's a problem for him. And this is why I think that they are 
reluctant to build it or refusing or playing games and things like that, is that is the long-term vision they've got, is the merger of the three countries into one North American Union. And you all may have heard of this idea of the NAFTA superhighway. This is a superhighway that comes into Lazaro Cardenas is the name of the port. The name of the port was the port was named after the president of Mexico, who in 1938 stole our oil companies down there, nationalized them, and so the Chinese, um, the the containers are going to come into a Lazaro Cardenas port. And they're going to come up all the way through Mexico, like an easy pass, right on through the border, straight on up, and the port where the containers are going to be inspected is Kansas City. Customs port. From there, the highway goes up to Winnipeg, up to Fairbanks, Alaska, and then it spreads out across the country. And the whole idea of this is to weld the three countries together the way the Union Pacific, the Northern Pacific, and the Southern Pacific welded America together, the way Eisenhower's interstate highway system. That's designed to make us all one nation, one people. It's a very Hamiltonian idea. And these folks want to weld the three countries together by north-south roads. The NAFTA superhighway is going to have 12 lanes. It's going to have lanes for trucks. It's going to have oil pipelines up the center, light rail traffic, cars and buses and trucks and everything. And that's the whole idea. And we can't get the government of the United States to explain it. I mean, you know, every time, there, uh, every time people go up there, people say, I don't know anything about that. But they got a website, and the highway is right up there. And so we know about it. And I think they know about it. Pat, you got time for two more. The first okay. one's on your left here. Hi, Pat. Uh, Hi. Basically, you've already answered a lot of what I was going to ask you and the question that this lady asked about the North American Union. Right. But I went from anger to fury with Bush when I found out that he had signed the SPP, mm -hmm. Security and Prosperity Partnership, you know, with Vicente Fox. Sure and with the then Canadian Prime Minister. Could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit more? And also, uh, just as an adjunct to the comment you made a few minutes ago about there's no better time than during election time to get a, a politician to commit. Right. Bush did that when he said he would move our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and he never did that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not so sure that you can hold these politicians' feet to the fire too much. But again, I would appreciate if you comment on the SPP a little bit. Right. Well, that's the, uh, and again, these are these sort of executive agreements uh, that are signed between presidents and they commit themselves to act, and they're not treaties that are submitted to the Congress of the United States. NAFTA, for example, was a treaty. It was a treaty, and it was, uh, but they submit them so that all they need to get is 50 votes. They don't need two thirds. But every treaty is supposed to go through two thirds of the Senate of the United States to pass. But now they sign them, and they call them agreements, and they run through 50 percent, all these trade deals, which are really treaties. But this whole idea, again, is I think it's reflective of basically what George W. Bush genuinely believes. I think he believes in open borders. I think he believes in, in free trade uniting the uh, first of the three countries, then the whole hemisphere. And I do not know whether he understands or not that any free trade agreement, total free trade agreement, eventually calls into existence a government on top of it to enforce the rules. Now, Hamilton put together a free trade area called the United States of America. And when he did, Hamilton, who was a centralizer, and I admire, Hamilton is my hero after Washington, he knew very well that when he did that, the, the central government would grow strong and Virginia and Pennsylvania governments would grow weak. And so he put together the United States, and we united this country that way. Bismarck followed his example in Germany. He eliminated all the tariffs among the German states and principalities, all the rest of them, in 1871 when they united them. And he put a tariff around Germany. So that forced the Germans to trade with one another and to develop and produce for export and also to develop for their own, um, for their, to build their own industries to make them economically independent. And so this is what I fear, is this, this whole thing uh, with security partnership. We are losing the economic independence of this country. You know, for the, it used to be, before 1970 or so, that the United States exported 8% of its gross national product and imported only 4%. 
you know, bananas and coffee and things that we didn't produce here, and certain minerals and things like that. Now we are importing something like 16% of GDP. And people say, well, you know, Pat, well, we export this high-tech stuff. No, no. You take a look at what we export to China. You know, we export fertilizer and wood, all these other things. Number one Chinese export to the United States is computers. They're building our computers. And not simply oil we're importing, we're importing high-tech items from Asia and particularly from China. China's going to have a $230 billion trade surplus against the United States this year. Our dependence upon foreigners is growing when the whole idea of Hamilton was to cut our dependence on Europe and especially Great Britain because he said, look, we just fought, bled, and died for our political independence. If we're economically independent on these people, we're going to be dragged into their wars. We're economically dependent on our oil, aren't we? And we've been dragged into these wars in the Middle East. So we need to restore our economic independence to the degree we can if we want to maintain our political independence. But Mr. Bush is headed in the other direction. Yes, sir. John, one more. In regards to the southern border, why did the state come down so hard on the two border patrolmen and were convicted last week and sentenced to over 10 years? Well, let's see. Uh, this is a situation where these, um, well, you folks obviously are very well aware of it. But I'll tell you this, back east they are not aware of the situation where these two border patrolmen uh, apparently apprehended a drug runner and, uh, and one of the border patrolmen, they were chased him down, and one of the border patrolmen pulled out something he thought was a gun, and he shot and winged him or something. And this, this criminal runs back into Mexico and ensues the United States, and then they prosecute these two fellows. What, they give them 10 or 20 years? Two border patrolmen. And this is appalling. And uh, I mean, again, it's when you start, look, when you start treating the people that defend you like that, and start treating the people who are preying upon you like these drug thugs with kid gloves as though they're some kind of hero, give them amnesty to come in and testify. Now this character, this drug runner, is going to sue the government of the United States or Border Patrol for $5 million because, you know, he hurt himself running through the back into Mexico. I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a encapsulated outrage that tells you what is wrong with this country and what we got to improve. And thank you all very, very much. My friends, my friends, Pat looks forward to greeting each of you in the lobby as he signs copies of his new book. For now, as we thank him for that bravura and far-reaching performance, we're mindful of all the times that he and Shelley have been guests of presidents in the real White House East Room, on the assumption that this Christmas they may not be invited by the President and First Lady. <laughs> We'd like to send them away with an official White House ornament for 2006. Well, thank Thanks you. a lot, Pat, because it's the closest you're going to get. Thank you very much. Go and stand here. Thanks, everybody. Drive carefully, and God bless America.